Well, good evening, everyone. Or good morning or afternoon to those who may be joining from a different state or country or time zone as well. My name is Brother Sevananda, and we're here in our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda's beautiful and iconic Hollywood temple. And I'm so happy to welcome all of you that are here, all of you joining in to this worldwide circle of SRF and YSS members and friends that make up what our Guru once called this happy family of self-realization. The subject of our class is entitled, Filling Our Cup of Happiness Through Service to Others. And this borrows from one of Paramahansa Yogananda's signature quotes and one of my favorites, really, and which encapsulates so fully the subject of service and how that ideal of service reaches into the deepest parts of our soul. He said, rather than be striving always for personal happiness, try to make others happy. In being of spiritual, mental, and material service to others, you will find your own needs fulfilled. As you forget self in service to others, you will find that without seeking it, your own cup of happiness will be full. And in these few words is a most profound recipe of spiritual living and the sure way to a life of purpose and fulfillment. And at the same time, these words also describe fully the path of yoga, union with God, and the process of spiritual growth, the process of transformation and expansion of that little self into the vast ocean of spirit. So let's use the magic wand of our Guru's teachings to uncover the uh, gems of this treasure filled statement further and see how again hidden within them, it, within them is the way to keep our cup of happiness full and overflowing as well. As mentioned, my name is Brother Sevananda and often we are asked what our name means or signifies. So in my case, Seva, as many of you will know, means service or selfless service. Or as one of my brother monks once said, service with a smile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what are you laughing at? So, yeah. And so seva means service and ananda means bliss. And so I seek to realize bliss through a life of service. And when I asked for, and that name was approved by our former president, Sri Dayamada, I thought, well, this will be easy. I, I like doing things for others and I'm not afraid of hard work. And that uh, bliss should be arriving any moment, so, yeah. But I soon began to realize that there's a lot more to service, to seva, to real seva, than just doing for others or being active. And that's also where the transformation of the little self or ego comes in. In other words, we might ask ourselves, how pure is our service, that action? Are we doing it solely for God or others? or perhaps for praise or recognition? Or how attached are we to the outcome of that action? Do we get upset or even angry if something or more likely someone uh, interferes with what we're trying to accomplish? So the, the point is if our service creates anything but happiness, if rather than the cup of our happiness, the cup of our unhappiness is full or the cup of our, our stress and, and uh, nervousness starts to fill up, then uh, we have a clue that our, our service, our seva, might be in need of a little transformation. And perhaps even worse or more subtle for the yogi, if, if service is taken too far, if, if one is busy for busy sake or it's because it's, it's a habit to always be on the go or never take time for ourselves, does that service or that activity become uh, like a, a subtle form of restlessness or an excuse to maybe uh, you know, avoid meditation or uh, cut short our meditation to some degree? Which brings up the last question of all. Do we consider meditation also as service? And is it perhaps the highest service of all? So these are the, letting you into my life a bit, these are the, the questions after I you know, thought the bliss was coming and when it didn't come right away, <laughs> then I, I, I started to think about this and, and uh, see how beautiful and rich all of these qualities are, of course. 
and, and this particular quality of service. So these are the questions over the course of my life that, that began to come up as I strive to purify my service and attain the bliss I seek. And we'll, we'll look into these questions as part of our talk tonight as well. You know, when Daima was conducting my uh, vow of sannyas and I came forward to receive my name, instead of, Ma didn't, Daima didn't say uh, Sevananda, bliss through service, which is the, the normal way that that might be uh, uh, explained or interpreted. Instead, she said, Sevananda, and then she paused and she said, may you know the bliss that comes from giving your life to God. I thought, hmm, just like I heard some hums there. That's interesting. The word service wasn't even in there. And yet the real essence or full meaning of service was giving one's life to God, giving our lives to God. Because the subject tonight isn't about me uh, only. It's about all of us. We know that that service, that seva, is such a, a, a part, such a huge part of all of our lives. You may recall from Paramahansaji's autobiography, not so long after he received his own vow of sannyas, how he said his guru, Swami Sri Teshwar, once asked him, why are you averse to organizational work? And our guru wrote, Master's question startled me a bit. It is true that my private conviction at the time was that organizations are hornet's nests. It is a thankless task, sir, I answered, no matter what the leader does or does not do, he is criticized. Do you want the whole divine shana or milk curd for yourself alone? My guru's retort was accompanied by a stern glance. Could you or anyone else achieve God communion through yoga if a line of generous hearted masters had not been willing to con convey their knowledge to others? He added, God is the honey. Organizations are the hives. Both are necessary. Any form is useless, of course, without the spirit. But why should you not start busy hives full of the spiritual nectar? And Paramahansaji concluded the story and said, his counsel moved me deeply. Although I made no outward reply, an adamant resolution arose in my breast. I would share with my fellows, so long as, lay, as far as lay is in my power, the unshackling truths I had learned at my guru's feet. Lord, I prayed, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of my devotion. And may I be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. And those of us in Self-Realization Fellowship, you go to Satsanga, we've heard that prayer and we use that prayer so often in our personal lives, in our services. And our guru once said, this was the most powerful prayer that God had ever given him. He said it was the greatest prayer that God had ever given him for this age. Receiving God's love, sharing God's love, giving one's life to God and to God and others. I remember our president, Brother Chirananda, was meeting with a group of us monks once and he said the perfect monk is he who strives to empty himself of everything but God. And I shouldn't give, you away all, give away all our secrets here, <laughs> you know, but, but I'm relating this again because it doesn't just apply to the, the monks or the nuns or the monastics. Really what Brother Chidadan is saying, this is the ideal for, for all of us, for, for disciples, monastic or not. Though certainly for monks it's a I know, an unavoidable part of our, essential part of our job description for sure. And so he said, the perfect monk is he who strives to empty himself of everything but God, meaning to empty ourselves out so that that infinite, you know, beloved, creative, dynamic, all loving spirit might flow through this form, through our forms, as if we're, I like to think as if we're like a flute that we hollow out so perfectly that, that Krishna or God or spirit can, can blow through and make the most beautiful music, the most beautiful melody unique to each one of our flutes. And, and 
blow through the expression of, of God, the creative om or amen, the eternal lullaby of the spirit. And in a way, what better service could we, could we perform, could we give than to make ourselves a perfect instrument that then can serve others in the, in the highest and best possible way? You know, referencing back to that idea of organizations being like uh, a hornet's nest. And the ashram will often use the respectful suffix G after uh, someone's name or when uh, addressing each other in the ashram. So it becomes like uh, Brother G or Sevananda G. And we'll often, uh, when writing each other an email or a text, we'll might start off, dear Brother G. And along these lines, I received an email once from one of my brothers. And you know how the brain, if, if, if the letters are transposed, how the brain automatically, without our knowing, it will, it will correct that word. We're not even aware that the letters are out of place. But in this case, the salutation did catch my eye. My brain didn't help me out do any pre-work here. And so someone wrote, instead of writing Dear Brother G, the first R was omitted, and so instead of Dear Brother G, <laughs> so you've already done it, uh, instead of Dear Brother G, it, it became Dear Bother G. <laughs> yeah, you know, just a, a minor difference. So, uh, so I, I emailed back and I said, well, I know this particular situation has had its share of excitement, but I, I sincerely hope I haven't been a Bother G <laughs> <laughs> about it, and we both had a had a good laugh. So let's not be a bother G, but a, a brother G, a sister G to each other. And in this, in this regard, I saw something interesting once from a teacher of the martial arts that impressed me when I read it, and which also starts to take our service or seva towards the realm of meditation, as mentioned earlier. And this person said, breathing and meditation teach us to be one with the chi or life force of the universe and to respect all God's creation. And he said, when inhaling, you are drawing in the chi of the universe. This chi unites with your body to give you strength. When exhaling, we must feel our chi pour forth and reach toward the heavens. This sharing of life energy unites us with the universe. In fact, uh, some of you might have heard how science says how atoms never really die. They, they just break down into their constituent parts and then reform again to become the elements of the world and then repeat that cycle. And in fact, uh, scientists say that all of us breathe in some of the atoms of every person that has ever lived and some that date back to the Big Bang itself. So again, it just shows how connected it all is, how connected we all are. Anyway, back to, back to this world. Uh, this person went on and said, the air we breathe is a most important thing. He said, it is a gift of love from the universe. We must always be grateful. As we become appreciative of the air we breathe, so too must we learn to appreciate everything in the universe. Through breathing and meditation, I have come to believe that I am part of an infinite universe in which all things are united. And he said, if you believe that all mankind is united, you will be more considerate of others. For every individual is somehow connected to you through the chi of the universe. This is what breathing and meditation have taught me. And it reminded me of, of this uh, it's this most fascinating footnote in our Guru's autobiography where someone once asked the Lord Buddha, why do we practice loving kindness towards everyone? And he answered, he said, because in the, the countless and varied life experiences, incarnations of every soul, he said, at one time or another, every other being has been dear to us. It's like, that's how, that's how cosmic it is. It's how intimate and personal and connected 
everything is. And so this gentleman concluded and said, my wife and I have never fought in more than 42 years of marriage. Maybe we had some harsh words once, but I cannot remember when. We are connected through the chi of the universe. Because we are so close, our chi is constantly flowing back and forth to one another. To fight with her would be like fighting with part of myself. And he said, this attitude must extend to everyone, not only those close to you. If you hate just one person, it makes it hard to love anyone. When we appreciate all that is around us, it makes our love for those close to us even stronger. You might remember also from our Guru's autobiography how Sri Teshruji once said, so long as you breathe the free air of earth, you are under obligation to render grateful service. And then yogic-like, he added, only he or she who has fully mastered the breathless state or samadhi is freed from cosmic imperatives. And again, here we have something so interesting because these great ones are freed from those cosmic imperatives. And yet, aren't they the, aren't they the, the most serviceful, the greatest servitors of all? giving one's life to God, again, that ultimate kind of service, a life given to God, a life that becomes what it always was, of God. In fact, in his commentary in the second coming of Christ, our guru explains how once a soul becomes truly successful in meditation, and he said, beholds that Christ consciousness, not only in themselves or others, he said it is natural that they then want to serve that Christ in all. And again, in whatever way spirit directs them, whether in some, some grand outer way, or perhaps in the smallest or sweetest little act in obscurity. In one of our Guru's whispers from eternity, again, one of my personal favorites, and, and we might take a meditative pause from our talk, so close your eyes if you wish and feel the perception of our guru's words that he wrote as follows. He wrote, O creator of all, in the garden of thy dreams, let me be a radiant flower. Or may I be a tiny star held on the timeless thread of thy love as a twinkling bead in the vast necklace of thy heavens. Or give me the highest honor the humblest place within thy heart. There I would behold the creation of the noblest visions of life. Give me the highest honor, the humblest place within thy heart. There I would behold the creation of the noblest visions of life. So we can open our eyes and we might ask then, what is service? What, how would we define an act of service? Again, in the back of our minds or maybe in the front of our minds, do we think service? And you know, when we think, like just a moment ago, these great ones that are freed from those cosmic imperatives but are the greatest servitors of all, do we think, well, that's in some, some grand way. So do we think that service means it, it needs to be recognized by others? It needs to be acknowledged by a large group. It has to be something uh, large in a certain sense. Or again, as our guru just said, can the smallest act, in fact, be the greatest or just as great? I saw this story once from a woman who wrote, during my second month of nursing school, our professor gave us a pop quiz. I was a conscientious student and had breezed through the questions until I read the last one. What is the first name of the woman who cleans the school? Surely this was some kind of joke. I had seen the cleaning woman several times. She was tall, dark-haired, and in her 50s. But how would I know her name? I handed in my paper, leaving the last question blank. 
Before class ended, one student asked if the last question would count toward our quiz, quiz grade. Absolutely, said the professor. In your careers, you will meet many people. All are significant. They deserve your attention and care, even if all you do is smile and say hello. She said, I've never forgotten that lesson. I also learned her name was Dorothy. <laughs> and I was thinking, smile and say hello. You know, is there potentially any, any greater or more meaningful service than that, that to let another human being know that, that they exist, that they're, they're noticed, that they're valued, just through that a, a smile, a hello from our, from our heart. Someone once said, I remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Uh, so, and that's an example of something just so simple and yet so beautiful as that. I saw another story once about a, a Zen priest in 1600s Japan by the name of Tetsugen Doko, who had said, set about to publish the Buddhist sutras, which at that time were available only in Chinese. And it said the books were to be printed with wood blocks in an edition of 7,000 copies at the time, an ambitious and tremendous undertaking. And the story goes on, Tetsugen began by traveling and connecting donations, collecting donations for this purpose. A few sympathizers would give him 100 pieces of gold, but most of the time he received only small coins. He thanked each donor with equal gratitude. And it said after 10 years, Tetsugen had enough money to begin his task. It happened, though, that at the time the Uji River overflowed. Famine followed. Tetsugen took the funds he had collected for the books and spent them to save others from starvation. Then he began again his work of collecting. Several years afterwards, an epidemic spread over the country. Tetsugen again gave away what he had collected to help his people. For a third time, he started his work. And after 20 years, his wish was fulfilled. And it says the printing blocks which produced the first edition of sutras can be seen today in the Obaku Monastery in Kyoto. And the story ends, the Japanese tell their children that Tetsugen made three sets of sutras and that the first two invisible sets surpass even the last. And in my mind, this is what service is. Service is love, love in action, action that results or is an expression of that love. For instance, in the story, to me, the sutras aren't about the sutras. They're about what we become by absorbing, by becoming those sutras, those teachings. And, it's, and so it's that invisible uh, spirit of seva that is its power that that uh, frees the one who gives it and the one who receives it. It, it lightens the journey, it lifts the burden of, of our humanity of, of living in this world. Again, serving God indeed with a smile and creating smiles along the way. And on this key ingredient of love, Sri Dayamata said something interesting once. She said, you can't be a real karma yogi without being in love with God. She said, otherwise, she say, what am I doing all this for? I'm doing it, she said, because I love my God and my guru. And for myself, and I, I know I don't speak just uh, for myself, but I don't do things for God or guru or for others because of what I'm going to get from that as if it's some sort of contract. It's just it's sort of, it's distasteful to me. I do it because something for someone else because I choose to do it. I do it from my heart. I do it out of love. And that's the reward. It's that in that moment, that, that bit of music that, that flows through the flute of our being when we, when we do something for others out of the so-called goodness of our hearts. And in fact, our guru said something so amazing once about the effect of this kind of service. He said, when you really do something for someone without any thought of using that person for your own selfish ends or desires, 
then you have momentarily stepped into Christ consciousness. And we also hear these terms and we might think Christ consciousness, it's so far on the horizon. And yet just when we do something for someone, as our Guru said, without, which we've all done, and if we could sort of stop at that moment and, and freeze it and, and look at it, we would know in that moment, oh, we would recognize, we, we would be aware, oh, that's that, that's that feeling, that's that, that bit of that Christ consciousness that has taken over my being, that has, has expressed through the fluid of my being because of that, that selfless, selfless act. That's why it feels so good, why it's so natural. And I like to think, why, don't, why not step into Christ consciousness as often as we can and, and have that feeling, have that experience. And from my experience, that, that love that Dayama talks about, that capacity to love and serve and give co- comes most directly and most naturally from meditation. And many of us are familiar with another uh, wonderful and defining quote from our guru that's really a prescription for our daily life. When he said, first meditate and feel the divine presence. Then do your work saturated with the consciousness of God. He said, if you do this, you will never become tired. If you work for your divine beloved, your life will be filled with love and strength. And this brings us to that earlier and last question, if meditation itself is perhaps the the greatest or the highest type of service, and if so, why? You know, in our Guru's commentary in the Bhagavad Gita, he talks about this. He talks about first jnana yoga, and then he compares that to specifically more to our topic, the path of karma yoga, or the way of selfless service. And the Lord here is speaking. It goes, when I sent man out in creation, I gave him two paths by which he could retrace his steps to me. Discrimination, Sankhya or Jnana Yoga, and right action, Karma Yoga, the highest activity of which is the scientific meditation of the yogis. So here Master says, Karma Yoga, the highest activity of which is the scientific meditation of the yogis. And our Guru explains further. He says, commonly interpreted, jnana yoga is the way of knowledge and discrimination. Karma yoga is the way of right action, spiritual and meditative. He said, the way of discrimination is for the rare, keen-eyed, wise man. For all others, the path of activity and meditation combined. And he said, the man who performs good actions is the external karma yogi. He who practices yoga meditation performs, he said, the highest action. He is the esoteric karma. You know, at times we might hear someone say, well, I'm a karma yogi. I don't know if you've ever heard that or maybe thought that yourself. Um, And with respect isn't what we're basically saying, is that, wow, you know, meditation, it just seems so hard and and to control my mind, to sit still. So we sort of throw our hands up a bit and we say to ourselves, well, I guess I'll just serve. Not that we abandon meditation completely, of course, but but perhaps we we, we fall into this habit of a mindset where we we sort of anticipate that our meditation is going to be restless or or uninteresting or just the same every time. And so we we say to ourselves, well, I I must be a karma yogi or I'll be a karma yogi. And so we kind of run the risk of, of giving up or marginalizing our meditation practice or feeling defeated. And of course, the right action that we perform is yoga. It brings that beautiful feeling when done selflessly for God and Guru, as we said. But the ongoing fuel for that 
service is comes mostly or or I would say in the greatest way from that practice of silent meditation from balancing our life and activity with meditation with as our master just explained the highest type of karma yoga the scientific meditation of the yogis and from that then that that love springs and something interesting here in this same section of our Guru's commentary, he added a corresponding interpretation by Lahiri Mahashai, who took it a step further and said, when a yogi practices Kriya Yoga, withdrawing his mind from the senses by disconnecting the life force from the five sense telephones, Lahiri Mahashai said, he is spoken of as following the path of karma yoga. He is a true karman. So putting this together, the Kriya Yoga meditation, the practice of Kriya, is none other than the path of karma yoga. As Larry Mahashai said, we're the true karma. And tying this all up in the chapter on the science of Kriya Yoga from our Guru's autobiography, he likewise explained this connection between Kriya Yoga and karma yoga at its most primal level. And he wrote, the Sanskrit root of Kriya is Kri, to do, to act and react. And then he said, the same root is found in the word karma, the natural principle of cause and effect. And he goes on, Kriya Yoga is thus union or yoga with the infinite through a certain action or right, Kriya. And he ends and says, a yogi who faithfully practices the technique is gradually freed from karma or the lawful chain of cause-effect equilibriums. So we see how God embedded into the law of karma, the law of uh, cause and effect, the very key or, or, or uh, quantum practice to free ourselves from that karma. And so in this way, Kriya itself, the, the, which our Guru said is the highest form of pranayama, it becomes the highest form of karma yoga, the highest activity, the highest way to, of service. In one of his talks, our Guru quoted a few lines from a poem which reads, God will surely ask, ere you enter heaven, have you done the task which to you was given? And so if we step back from all the, the, these words and thoughts and we ask ourselves, what is the task that to us was given? What's our, what's our task in life? What's the task laid before every human being? It's just one, to find God, to reunite our soul with God, with our creator. And it follows then that the greatest service the greatest activity we can perform to ourselves, to the world, to the universe, is to become reunited with God, to become a God-realized, God-knowing, awakened soul, that, again, that perfect instrument through which God can then make that divine music to, to express through the flute of each one of our lives, each flute created by the master flute maker, himself. So the point is, and the encouragement and reminder that these words from the Gita and from our Guru are meant to give is that we continue that, uh, on this talk of service, to, not to forget about the value, the importance of balancing that service with meditation, realizing that that meditation is service. Even if just a few minutes, morning and evening, if that's all our duties, allow, but meditating with faith that that meditation will be blessed by God and Guru. Our Guru, in fact, said once that even for the beginner meditator, he said, God responds to the devotee's every effort, every devotional call, even, he said, for the beginner meditator. And, and if we look at those words, uh, our master didn't say, well, he responds to one or two efforts or, 
you know, every now and then, uh, or if he's in a good mood. So, but he said every effort, every devotional call, and that means every. And, and to add to that encouragement, our Guru once said, effort is progress. Effort itself is progress in meditation. And so looking at it in that light, every meditation is a good meditation. It's a great meditation. It's the most thrilling endeavor, that the thrilling type of service. It's like, it's like we're in, in Jedi school, you know, like learning the, the ways of the force, of life force, of Kriya Yoga, of, of reuniting ourselves with God, of returning back up the spine, back to our our true self, back to spirit. So of course it'll be a challenge, of course there'll be effort, but as our Guru said, it's the most, ex- it's the most thrilling challenge, it's, it's our greatest adventure. Speaking of, of Zen once, I, I remember, uh, uh, or speaking of Zen before, I remember this uh, old Zen saying that, that goes, uh, you should meditate 20 minutes a day, unless you're too busy. And then it says, and you should meditate an hour. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to try to explain what that means. I think we all know. But one, one final thought about, uh, with regards to the activity of meditation as service, and that to take it out of this, this idea of, our, of a, perhaps a personal struggle is to realize that when we meditate, when we strive to uh, unite our bodies, minds, hearts, and souls with spirit, that we are performing not only the highest act of service to ourselves, but it's also an act of service to the world, that meditation is helping to uplift the whole world as well. Again, Sri Dayamada once said on this subject, she said, there is great value in what all of you are doing by meditating and keeping your minds filled with thoughts of God. And she went on, when you sit to meditate, you may think to yourself, I'm just not getting anywhere. But my dears, you do not know the tremendous good you are doing. And she said, whether you are making obvious progress or not, as often as you take time to meditate, as often as you send out a prayerfully powerful good thought, so often are you contributing to the greater welfare of humanity. And again, in this way, as our topic uh, expressed, we, our own cup of happiness becomes full. You know, whether, we, whether we're aware of, uh, of how that's happening, whether we feel our meditation is, is uh, we're making progress in meditation, we will be happy. We'll be happy doing that because that meditation has the blessing of God and the great ones we're tuning in to to cosmic laws. And then our whole life becomes a sort of a seamless offering of service. We no longer separate as if now I'm, I'm active and now I meditate. But it's just, it's, it's one life of service. It's, it's one act of, of being, it's one act of living. And from the Bhagavad Gita, again, Lord Krishna explains how every act of our life can then be a portal to that divine presence. When he says, whatever actions thou dost perform, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, whether in eating or in observing spiritual rites or in gift bestowing or in self-disciplining, dedicate them all as offerings to me as service. Thus, no action of thine can enchain thee with good or evil karma. With thyself steadfastly anchored in me by yoga and renunciation, thou shalt win freedom and come unto me. So for example, when we awaken in the morning before we begin our day's work, as our guru said, we meditate and we, we offer or see that meditation as service to, to developing our own self, our own soul, and as helping to uplift the, the world as well. And then when we go about our day's activities, we offer our creativity and whatever we do towards how it will benefit or bring value to others. Before we eat, which 
and Lord Krishna included in his statement. We can think and pray that that food might nourish these amazing uh, bodies, these amazing and wonderful physical forms, that they might be able to serve with strength and vitality. And then before we sleep, we can ask that that rest might rejuvenate our bodies and minds so that the next day we can again offer our loving actions in service to the world and to others. And so the, the point is service doesn't only mean actions done for, for others, as if taking time for ourselves or for our own well-being and development is not in some way service as well, or as if in some way it's selfish rather than, than service as well. In fact, uh, you might recall how before takeoff, the airline personnel says in the event of a you know, drop in cabin pressure that uh, oxygen masks will uh, appear magically you know, <laughs> uh, in front of us. But what else do they advise? They say they advise to put one's own mask on first before helping someone next to us, which may feel or seem counterintuitive to us, that we wouldn't, the urge wouldn't be to instantly look to help others. But of course, the, you know, the reason is if we pass out, then, then that's the end of whatever we can do to, to help if, that, if there's something further that needs to be done. So I'm not an endorsing what we should or shouldn't do. Uh, um, but the, the point is that self-care is not necessarily selfish care. I remember uh, uh, I saw, uh, read about a study in uh, psychology, the magazine Psychology Today, where the uh, research group went to, to study the potential health benefits of doing good for others. And so they, they took a group of, of adults with high blood pressure, divided them into two groups, and half the, they gave money to both groups. And to the f half the group, they said, here, you just have a good time, use the money in whatever way you want. The other half, they said you should spend this money on someone else. Donate to a charity, uh, give it to somebody in need, buy somebody a gift, and so forth. And a few weeks afterwards, the researchers then measured the blood pressure of both groups. And it turned out the blood pressure, both the diastolic and the systolic, of those participants who had spent the money on others had decreased significantly as compared with the group that had spent the money on themselves. And in fact, it said the decrease in blood pressure was similar in size to the effect of starting high-frequency exercise or a healthier diet. And so, of course, this type of research is potentially profound. I don't think it would be necessarily surprising to us. But the point is, this doesn't mean that just because doing good for others uh, or by doing good for others, it lowers our blood pressure or, you know, <laughs> boosts our immune system, you know, just because that happens, that we can then get by without ourselves exercising or, or having a healthy diet as if, now I found the excuse I've been looking for to just, <laughs> you know, stay on the couch and not have to, you know, put the gear on and, and get out and, and exercise. So, no, serve others and ourselves. That, that will really lower our blood pressure. Because again, taking time in our in our lives as appropriate to care for our own body and mind, our own physical and mental health will make us more able to help others take care of theirs. Or perhaps just by that example alone will inspire them to, to do the same. And in this way, we're likely to be more ready to be of service, to be more present, I think, for each person we meet, each 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 present moment, each situation we face, each challenge, as Brother Satyananda was referring to last night. And I was thinking, is life any you know, more than that? Is it any less than that, than just giving our best, bringing our best to whatever or to whomever is in front of us in each moment, in each present moment that life brings? And then we uh, will no longer need to wonder if our service can or will make a difference in this world. 
And so to wrap up all these various points, there's a most beautiful story that occurred right here in this, again, this most beautiful and sacred Hollywood temple. And it was when the temple was getting ready to be opened in the 1940s, and a devotee was helping to clean the lead framing of the stained glass windows right here to my left. And those are the windows that our, our guru had uh, found and brought to be installed. And we know how that, that work can be um, rather slow and painstaking and, and tedious at times. And so although th this devotee was, was happy to serve, still in the back of their mind was a bit of, of those thoughts and feelings going on. And so our guru happened to walk by at that moment. And by the way, he walks by in all those similar moments in our lives as well. That's the good news, really. And, uh, and in this case, he, he happened to walk by uh, and picked up on that inner attitude. And he said, know this, if you clean those windows with enthusiasm and in that spirit of joyous service and that it's a privilege to do this for God, each time in future that someone passes by and is inspired by their beauty, you will receive a blessing. And again, that's how sort of indescribably big it all, it all is, how how connected it all is, how God-centered it all is, all life, all creation, all love, all of us. And the same goes for any type of service done purely for the Lord, any time, anywhere, not just here or in some uh, sacred shrine. The whole world is God's shrine. The whole world is God's temple. Our home is God's temple. He loves waiting to visit us in the temple of our own home, the temple of our own heart. And then again, seva just becomes with these uh, attitudes, it becomes just a, a way of life. It becomes our life, giving our life to God like uh, that hollow flute through which the Lord can blow that song of Christ or Krishna consciousness through us whether we're meditating, praying, eating, or, or doing for others, whatever that type of service may be. And I want to say, speaking for all of the monastics, we see how filled all of you are with this type of service, this spirit of seva, of guru seva, doing for others, doing for this great work with such kindness, and helpfulness and love. And so in this happy family of SRF and YSS, there's many Sevanandas out there. <laughs> yeah. Giving our lives to God, giving your lives to God as disciples and followers of this great and incomparable path. So to close our talk about filling our cup of happiness through service to others, we'll end with this quote from our guru. And then we'll serve a bit more by having a few minutes of meditation and praying for others. And so our guru said, life should be chiefly service. Without that ideal, the intelligence that God has given you is not reaching out toward its goal. When in service you forget the little self, you will feel the big self of spirit. And he said, as the vital rays of the sun nurture all, so should you spread rays of hope in the hearts of the poor and forsaken. Kindle courage in the hearts of the despondent and light a new strength in the hearts of those who think that they are failures. When you realize that life, life is a joyous battle of duty and at the same time a passing dream, and when you become filled with the joy of making others happy by giving them kindness and peace, in God's eyes your life is a success. And indeed, our own cup of happiness will always be full and filled to overflowing. So let us now have a short period of meditation.
which as mentioned is also service, the highest type of service to put us in tune with God so that all other forms of service might flow from that highest identity of our self, of our soul with spirit, of our oneness with spirit. So let's sit in the meditation posture, the hands resting on the thighs, shoulders slightly back, chest out, spine straight, chin parallel to the floor. And then with the eyes lifted to the Christ or Krishna center between the eyebrows. And then open the cup of our heart, allow that feeling of happiness to fill our heart, the, allow the love of God, the peace of God, the presence of God to fill up the cup of our heart. And then to help draw the mind and attention further within, let's inhale, clench the fists, tense the body, and then exhale and relax. (sighs) Inhale and tense. Exhale and relax. (sighs) Inhale and tense. Exhale and relax. (sighs) Now just remain still. Just let the breath flow naturally. At last year's convocation during the three-hour meditation that Brother Chidananda led for us, he had us affirm for a few moments as the breath came in, Lord, thou art in me. And then, then as the breath flowed out, Lord, I am in thee. So let us do that just for a few moments again with our eyes closed first. Just just watch the breath. Just allow the the breath to flow naturally as it will in and out. We are not the breath, we are not the body. We are watching the breath, watching the body. Now the next time the breath flows in, think and feel, Lord, thou art in me. And then as the breath flows out, Lord, I am in thee. The breath flows in, thou art in me, I am in thee. I am in thee. I am in thee. Thou art I, I am thou. Thou art I, I am thou. So let's continue to meditate. Feel our connection with God, with the universe. Thou art in me, I am in thee. Thou art in me, I am in thee.
And now with our eyes still closed, let us end our meditation by praying for others, which again is one of the highest ways to serve. Feel the peace and love in our hearts that we've gathered in these few minutes of silence. And then use the broadcasting power of the spiritual eye to send out that love as a powerful healing force, as a great light to help heal others in body, mind, and soul. First, let's visualize that healing light entering the bodies, minds, and souls of our families and loved ones. And then send broadcast that healing light to all our fellow devotees and friends who follow this great path, our worldwide spiritual family. And then out to the entire world and all living things, visualize the entire earth bathed in that healing light. All our brothers and sisters everywhere, all living things. Now let's have a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, Friend, friend, Beloved God, God, Great Gurus, gurus, Saints of all religions, religions, we bow to you all. all. Beloved God, God, teach me to feel for others others, as I feel for myself. May I work out my own salvation salvation by serving my fellow man. man. May thy love love shine forever forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. devotion. And may we be able able to awaken thy love love in all hearts. Peace. Amen. I wish you wish you all a most wonderful rest of convocation together and a most wonderful rest of all time after that as well. So <laughs> all the best always. <laughs>